1 through 3A, 6 through 15, page 736 of the Old Testament of the Pew Bible. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedidiah of Judea, which was the 18th year of Ebuchadnezzar, and that at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedadiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanimal, son of your uncle, Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anatroth for the right of redemption. Buy purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanimal came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anatroth in the land of Benjamin for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anatroth from my cousin Hamnel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of ah, Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hamnel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were there sitting in the court of the guard in their presence, I cherished Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and the open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Thanks be to God. This is the living word of God. All right. There's a slight change of plans. You'll see there in the bulletin that there's supposed to be a scripture reading there. But in the interest of uh, time... Choir's got to get on the road and get up to Spokane, and uh, the weather, you know. So we're going to get them. We're going to get them out of here as quick as we can. In fact, Barb, go ahead, get out of here. <laughs> All right, and the rest of you, don't make me send you. You know what you did. All right. Now, so there won't be any scripture reading, but at this time we will also dismiss our children for a junior church. If you want to follow Lori right back there, Lori will hold her hand up and give a little wave. There she is back there by the door. So you feel free to run out that way. All right. There, oh, there we go. Here comes a few. All right, they're coming. So this week is our last week in the season of creation. We've been talking about being good stewards of the good gifts that God has given to us. And in fact, next month, we're going to talk a lot more about stewardship. In both churches, we're going to have our stewardship campaigns going on. So uh, Clarkston, you're used to that. Lewiston, has been uh, this will be the first time in a while. So we're excited for it to talk about how we can be good uh, stewards of what God has given us. This month we've been talking about creation and nature, how we want to make sure that there's room at the table for everybody, because there is. There's room at the table for everybody. Um, especially if we rein in a little bit our greed and our um, drive to want to make sure we have the best spots at the table. You know, it's kind of like um, it's a round table. 
you know? There's no best spot at the table. Everybody's welcome. They're all good spots at the table, and there's plenty to go around. And that's kind of what we've been talking about this week, uh, this month. Last week, we talked about how we have to, if we want to be serious about making change where change might be needed in any situation, you have to first recognize the wound and see that there's a wound. Not shy away from it. Walk through the wound. It's okay. Woundedness is a part of life. We don't want to rush past it because when you try to rush past a wound or rush through a wound, you do more damage than the healing process really calls for. So that's what we talked about last week. This week, I want to talk a little bit about the renewal of all things, uh, how we have a promise of a renewal of all things. I want to begin by sharing a couple of quotes that I really appreciate. They're quotes that kind of encapsulate this idea of having a long view of the story and trusting in a good story that God is telling And I think these quotes uh, from people who may not even realize they were talking about this, but I think it rings true to God's good story. Nelson Henderson said, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you will not sit. There's a long view of the world, right? Like I'm gonna do something now because I believe in the future that I believe in what the future can hold for someone else, uh, and even me along the way. Warren Buffett said, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? All right. So in Jeremiah chapter 32 that Kathy read, and Kathy, I'm so sorry that I give you such a hard passage of scripture with so many names. Yeah, that's right. I purposely hold back and I'm like, well, I'm waiting until Kathy gets. <laughs> so a little bit of uh, historical context is in order about this chapter. All right. So we've been talking about Jeremiah a little bit. We kind of understand he's a prophet and he's talking to the nation of Judah, the tribes of Judah, the two southern tribes of Judah and uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. And um, he's prophesying to them, telling, look, you gotta, you got to change how you're doing things. You can't mistreat the poor and, and run them into the ground, and you can't turn God's good creation into waste. He talks about how the waters are drying up and the wells are cracking because people are, are just, they don't care. They don't have this long view, and they don't care about other people but themselves. And so he's warning them that if you, if you don't change, if you don't uh, adjust, Some bad is going to happen. Well, in this chapter, the bad is happening. Okay, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been taken away, is in fact gone. It's been taken into exile. That's already happened. So he's left there, southern kingdom, Judah. And this is where Jeremiah is living. Only two tribes. It's tiny. It's smaller. It's smaller than the northern kingdom. And at that point, Judah, the kingdom, had paid other countries not to invade. You know, they knew we, we can't withstand this, so we'll just pay so that we do not get invaded and taken into exile. And they've made an alliance with Egypt that they hope uh, Egypt will protect them when they need it. And Jeremiah was called to be this prophet a hundred years after the nor- northern kingdoms had already been taken away. Now there's a new threat coming And this new threat is the nation of Babylon. And they're threatening to come in. And and Jeremiah's prophesying they're going to come into the capital city of Jerusalem. And they're going to take it away. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in 586 BC. That country is taken away into exile. So Jeremiah, when he's writing, he's before the invasion into the invasion and then after the invasion and people are taken away. That's when he's writing. So they've came, they've carried off exiles to Babylon. They spared the city of Jerusalem and left a few uh, residents there. And so people were beginning to believe, oh, you know, Jerusalem will never fall. But Jeremiah is telling them, listen, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. But here's where it gets a little weird. Okay. Ten years later, the Babylonians return. They surround Jerusalem to cut off supplies. They're laying siege to the city of Jerusalem. An army from Egypt is coming from the south to assist in the defense of Jerusalem, as they had before. 
But Jeremiah counsels, counsels the king to surrender to the king of Babylon because otherwise, otherwise they're going to get crushed. The king is not happy with this counsel. So the king has Jeremiah locked in prison. You know, sometimes we do that to people who tell us the truth. When we don't like the truth, we just send them away, you know? We do that sometimes. And it's while he's in prison, the Babylonians are surrounding the city. Jeremiah's cousin comes to him with what's going on in today's passage of scripture. He comes to Jeremiah. He might think Jeremiah's an idiot or something, right? I, I don't know. He might think, hey, Jeremiah's kind of foolish. I'm going to try to sell him my land, you know? Well, all this is going on. It's worthless now. Uh, nobody's going to buy it, but maybe Jeremiah might. He's a little crazy. He's just kind of foolish. And so the cousin comes to him with this proposition. Will you buy my land? And, and, and the land is actually where uh, Jeremiah was born. So it's kind of like his home turf. And um, he's basically giving Jeremiah an opportunity to buy this parcel of land. And what makes this, of course, an absurd request is that this land lies east of the wall of the city of Jerusalem. So it's already occupied by the armies of Babylon. It, 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 Literally, it's not even their land right now to be selling. Jeremiah is in prison. The land is occupied. People are finally realizing the truth of what's about to happen. And to our utter astonishment, Jeremiah agrees to the purchase, saying, the Lord has told me to do this, to make this purchase. And he doesn't do it quietly, right? He's like, hey, I want everyone to know how foolish I am right now, right? I want to make a big deal out of it. He makes a big production because he wants everybody to know about it. And so I'm sure this did nothing to make people change their minds that he's nuts, right? They already think he's crazy. And now here he is land speculating on land occupied by the enemy. But Jeremiah measures out 17 shekels of silver. At the time, uh, silver was weighed, uh, measured by weight rather than by coins. Now, we don't know if this is buying low or high. I'm not sure. We don't have <laughs> any way of knowing. Uh, I don't know the size of the piece of the land. I don't know the relative value of the money at that time. But we just know that this makes no sense from a practical standpoint. And absolutely no sense. So then he makes a big deal out of preparing the deed and preserving the deed. He makes... Um, uh, make sure everyone knows, hey, I'm making this, this purchase of land. Here's my public display, the public deed and a private deed, but I want you to see them both. One copy sealed, the other open for public record. Um, and then he has them, you know, sealed in jars and buried. He entrusts the deed to his most trusted, I won't say friend, because I don't think Jeremiah at this point had any friends. But somebody who was some kind of a scribe or a partner to him, Baruch, and he says, put it in a clay pot where it can be preserved for a long time. I don't know why he did this. Why did he do this? But here's the punchline. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. The city is about to fall, but he's telling them, you know what? This is not the end of the story. Everything has been turned upside down here. For years, Jeremiah has been prophesying doom and gloom. This is what's coming. He's trying to break through their, um, you know, their thick-headedness or their numbness. Trying to break through to the community and let them know, look, everything is not okay. Stop pretending everything is okay. Religious leaders, stop pretending like you have all the answers. You don't. And finally, the reality has sunk in and the people are... They are now sinking into despair and hopelessness. All is lost. And now Jeremiah is saying, no, no, hang on. Wait a minute. Don't lose hope. This is not the end of the story. God is still God, and we have a future. And because of that, I'm buying this property. So in our text here, Jeremiah, he's mandated by God to buy the family property in a moment when land has almost no value. And in obedience, he does so. 
And I think I want to talk here about optimism versus hope. You've heard both of those words before, right? Optimism, hope. Um, I'm going to put it to you how Cornell West put it. He says, sometimes people accuse me of being an optimist because I say that God has a better future in mind and in store for us. And people say, how can you be such an optimist? And he says, I'm not. In fact, I, everything is terrible. <laughs> I am not an optimist at all. He says that optimism is the belief that things are going to turn out as you would like. And he says, right now, I have no evidence that it will turn out the way I would like. It's not. Right now, the way things are, if it keeps going like this, it is not going to turn out the way I like. So I have no optimism, but I have hope. And hope is this, he says. Hope is that which, when you are thoroughly convinced something is right and just, you do it anyway, regardless of the consequences. And in that sense, he says, I'm full of hope, but I'm not an optimist. So negatively, it's clear that serious hope for the future is not grounded in present data. You might put it that way. Indeed, all of Jeremiah's circumstances say you should not be making investments right now. Hope is an act that primarily contradicts the facts on the ground. But put positively, hope, I think, consists of two ingredients. First, hope is grounded in this deep understanding of what God wants for the world. God wants a peaceable, workable, place of houses and fields and vineyards for everybody in times to come. Jeremiah is committed to a hope grounded in what God wants. What God wants. And Jeremiah knows that I believe in that, even though the present data tells me that ain't going to happen. <laughs> but second, hope is not just a passive reliance on God. I think hope involves a human act of commitment to and investment in the future. Hope is an act of human courage, and it refuses to cherish the present too much or to be reduced by despair by the present circumstances. Hope, I think, is the capacity to relinquish the present for the sake of what is better, what could be better. So in the end, I think hope is a practice that bets on a vision of the future. And it's not to be judged by present circumstances. So on the one hand, Christian faith affirms love in the end wins. Love wins. Without that, without that conviction, there is no reliable hope. But we believe that. I believe that. I think it, it tells us that God has a vision for the future, and God is love. Love wins. But that sureness about God's large um, desire is not just an assurance. It's actually a call. It's a summons to be risky. Invest in the risky future, even though the world might think it's foolish. Right? Because it seems foolish right now to plant a tree for the future, doesn't it? But somebody did it. And there they are. Who are we going to plant the trees for in the future? I think when we put what God wants together with human risk-taking, I think we can start to create an alternate reality and a new future. And I think that's what we've been mandated as Christians to do and to be. And I think when people get it right, when Christians, when we've got it right, man, we've seen the alternate future and reality break into the present, haven't we? Martin Luther King Jr., man, that guy was sold on a better dream and a better vision. And he worked and he risked for it. And I think we saw, could see, some of that future reality breaking in. 
Or it might look like this. Um, there's a guy named Father Greg Boyle is his name. And he, uh, maybe you've heard of the business that he helped start. It's called Homeboy Industries. Ever heard of that before? Nobody? Yes? I see a few nods of, of heads. How about back here? Homeboy Industries. All right, so here's what it is. Father Greg Boyle, you've heard about it back there? Yes, awesome. Okay, so uh, basically, Greg Boyle was working with um, ex-convicts, people who were turned out of a prison. And, you know, he did like some of the normal things, you know, feed and clothe and all that kind of stuff. But he realized, you know what? If we don't do something different together, the present reality for them is going to just keep continuing. They're probably going to end up back where they were, for lots of different circumstances. And so what they need is somebody to believe in a different future for them. And they need to believe in a different future for them. They need some hope. And so he gave them, he helped with them create some hope. He, he, he learned that a lot of these uh, convicts have, a lot, ex-convicts have a lot of talent and ability that they actually hone in prison. And when they're out, they can use those skills to do things. And so they've created Homeboy Industries, and they make soap, and they make candles, and they make uh, other cleaning products, and they're, they're just, their whole business model is just skyrocketing. And hundreds now of ex-convicts have workable, sustainable futures, where before they didn't. But it was that somebody took a risk they took a risk and believed in a different future, an alternate reality than their present circumstances. That's one way it could look like. Or it could just simply look like in your life, you're going to have to wrestle with this a little bit. You're going to have to answer the questions. What do, what's the alternate future that I hope for? And if it were real, what would I be doing then? Maybe I should start doing it now. Because it's one thing to talk about what's wrong, what's happening. It's another thing to start living a new future. It's a whole different thing. I started with some quotes about trees, and I think it's also appropriate to end with a quote about some trees, because I think it encapsulates this idea of one thing to use words and talk about what's wrong. is another thing to live like I think things should be says this. Wangare Matai says, until you dig a hole, until you plant a tree, until you water it and make it survive, you haven't done a thing. You're just talking. You want a better future? Live it now. That's what God is calling us to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the example of prophets like Jeremiah, Martin Luther King Jr., folks who believe, despite the present circumstances and all data, that there's hope rooted in what you want for the world. And they took risks. And they invested in a future that maybe they weren't even going to see. We know Jeremiah did not see uh, ever come he never came back again and yet he invested in a future because of the hope he had the same with martin luther king jr god we thank you for these wonderful testaments and examples for us god give us the courage now to risk to make an investment in a better future than the present we can do that with hope. Not blind optimism, not passive hope, but real hope. Give us the courage to act on our convictions and in hope. We love you, God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.